In today's video, we're going to be talking about myasthenia gravis, which is a neuromuscular junction disorder, and the effects of it lead to skeletal muscle weakness. The actual medical definition of myasthenia gravis is a disease which is characterized by progressive weakness and exhaustibility of voluntary muscles without atrophy or sensory disturbance, and it is caused by an autoimmune attack on acetylcholine receptors at neuromuscular junctions. What we can gather from this definition is that myasthenia gravis, which affects about 200 people per million, is that it's basically just the body attacking its own receptor cells in the neuromuscular junction. So the neuromuscular junction is responsible for helping us to move and contract our skeletal muscles. So if these receptors here are getting blocked, then obviously the resulting effect will be weakness of the muscles. Let's have a look at how a neuromuscular junction works in a healthy individual. So we have this impulse or action potential which arrives at the neuromuscular junction we have these synaptic vesicles which contain neurotransmitters which move forward and then they fuse with the presynaptic membrane in a process called exocytosis and then they release this neurotransmitter across into the synaptic cleft and then this neurotransmitter binds onto these nicotinic acetylcholine receptors which are on the motor end plate and then through some other steps muscle contraction is then able to occur. In myasthenia gravis, since it's an autoimmune disease, antibodies are made by the body which attack these nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, or it can also attack a similar protein which is called muscle-specific kinase. The point is that these antibodies are made and they attack the receptors involved in the transmission of a nerve impulse to the muscle, so the resulting effect is muscle weakness. So now we know how myasthenia gravis occurs, we need to talk about the symptoms of the disease. So we can have a ptosis, which is where we have a drooping of an eyelid, and that's due to weakness of the levator palpebri superioris muscle. We can also have a lazy eye, which is known as amblyopia. The patient may also have slow speech, and that's due to weaknesses involved in the muscles of speaking. They could have difficulty chewing due to weakness of the muscles of mastication. There may also be facial weakness, so the patient might have their mouth hanging open or their head drooping to one side. And they may also have difficulty swallowing, and in very severe cases, the muscles involved in breathing are too weak, so the patient is basically not able to breathe. Myasthenia gravis can be classified into different types, and it's based on the severity of the disease. So I won't go into too much detail here, but it ranges from class 1 to 5, and there are different subtypes here as well, but the important thing that you need to know is the higher in class you go, the more severe the disease is. So class one just shows that there is just slight eye muscle weakness and maybe ptosis or drooping of the eyelid. And there's no other evidence of muscle weakness elsewhere in the body. However, when we get to class five, this is where the patient is having severe difficulty in breathing and hospitalization is very important because they need intubation to help maintain their airways. The diagnosis of myasthenia gravis can be done through a few different ways. The first one is through a physical examination, so a doctor just examines the patient and how they're looking. They check if they see any facial weaknesses on one side, and they also particularly look at the eyes. There's a neurological test which you can do which is called the curtain sign, and that's a key indicator of myasthenia gravis. In some cases of myasthenia gravis, we have unilateral drooping of an eyelid, so this is known as unilateral ptosis. In this case, we can do a neurological test which gives us the result known as curtain sign. In normal cases, the innervation of the eyes is equal on both sides. With unilateral ptosis in myasthenia gravis, when you manually lift up the eye which is drooping, the brain sends a signal to the normal eye telling it to relax a bit, so the healthy eyelid starts to droop. This test is known as the curtain sign and it's a key indicator of myasthenia gravis. Other tests can be done like blood tests to see if there's any antibodies present in the blood which are against the acetylcholine receptor. An ice pack test can also be used to help diagnose myasthenia gravis. And what happens is you place a cold ice pack on the eye for between two to five minutes. And in cases of a drooping eyelid or ptosis, 
with myasthenia gravis that I will basically open up and appear normal, but in healthy individuals this won't make a difference. And the reason this works is because the enzyme acetylcholine esterase becomes inhibited at these low temperatures. So we have a sort of a temporary resolution of the drooping eyelid and that helps us diagnose myasthenia gravis. So just to end the video, we're going to very briefly talk about some treatment methods for myasthenia gravis. Uh, so some medications can be given. These include acetylcholine esterase inhibitors, which basically inhibit the function of acetylcholine esterase. So the acetylcholine uh, neurotransmitter is not broken down as frequently. So it helps to maintain the transmission of the impulse from the nerve to the muscle. Surgery can also be done and this is in cases where the patient has a tumor or an excessive enlargement of the thymus. So in cases of myasthenia gravis, there is hyperplasia of the thymus and cancerous tissue may develop. So surgery is done if there is a thymoma present and it's not really beneficial for having an effect on the symptoms of myasthenia gravis, but it's mainly done when there is a thymoma and the procedure is known as a thymectomy. Plasmapheresis is also another treatment method which basically removes all of these antibodies which are attacking the receptors from the circulation and this is usually done in severe cases uh, when the patient has been hospitalized, but it's not really done very regularly because it only has a short acting benefit and uh, it's a very expensive procedure. So it's only really reserved for cases where the patient's been put in hospital and they're having difficulty breathing. Lastly, physical therapy is also another treatment method and it's usually done to help encourage the patient to exercise frequently, but also rest frequently and there are also other exercises that they are given to help with their breathing and with their posture as well.